Welcome to The Collectors, I'm Kent Lund, your host. I'm sure everybody in Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Franklin has been to the Hunter House at least once. But have you actually been to the original Hunter House? We're going inside the Hunter House next on The Collectors. So now let's go meet Caitlin, who's going to give us a tour of the original Hunter House. Hi, Caitlin Donnelly. Yes. Hi, Kent Lund. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to the Collectors. Well, welcome to the Birmingham Museum and welcome to the Hunter House. We're super happy to be here. <laughs> Caitlin, you're the, you're the um, assistant and tour guide and you're going to tell us all about this house. Yeah, so this house was built in 1822 by a man named John West Hunter. And this was actually his second house that he built here in what would become Birmingham. Um, he moved here in 1819 and he accidentally built his first log cabin on his neighbor's land. So once his neighbor Elijah Willits moved in, he had to then build this house on his land. <laughs> okay, and, and Willits might be the reason for the Willits building in Birmingham. Yes, and the street named Willits. Um, there's a lot of things okay. named after Elijah Willits. And where was this house originally? I know it's been moved here to the museum, but where was it right. originally? It's been moved twice. Originally it was at the northwest corner of Maple and Old Woodward Road. Okay. That was kind of where all four original land claims converged. So um, John West Hunter was a veteran of the War of 1812. Oh boy. And after the war, the United States government wanted this area settled and settled very quickly. Uh, really, during the war, only Detroit was settled. Um, there was no one in outlying areas or suburbs. Um, so they gave the veterans a really great deal on land, uh, about $2 an acre instead of 5 And they all followed the Saginaw Trail into Oakland County. Um, which is Woodward. Woodward Avenue today Avenue. follows the route of the old Saginaw Trail, which is a Native American trail that we have evidence of people using 10,000 years ago. So, okay. extremely old. Yes. Um, so, when they moved to this area, they moved here because Pontiac was going up and it was going to be a great big city and draw people from all over to that city. And Pontiac was two days journey along the Saginaw Trail from Detroit. So people would have to stop in the middle and they needed food, they needed a place to sleep. If your wagon broke or your horse threw a shoe, you, they needed that replaced. So John West, John West Hunter and two of the other founders realized that there was a good deal of money to be made along the Saginaw Trail, particularly at the midway point between Detroit and Pontiac. Makes sense, sure. Yeah, and that's why Birmingham is where it is. Wow. <laughs> so John West Hunter um, was a blacksmith. He did open a foundry in Birmingham um, later on. So if your wagon axle broke, he was your guy. Did and you? he also rented out his front bedroom to travelers traveling along the trail. And he had a liquor license too. After a hard day wow, on the trail, like a great place. <laughs> after a hard day on the trail, you might need something to drink. So he was your guy. So we're standing in the kitchen of the house now. Okay. Um, but this kitchen was built on when we moved the house here in 1970. In 1822, if you lived in the middle of nowhere, which is what Birmingham was, you wouldn't have had a kitchen connected to your house, because then as now the vast majority of fires start in the kitchen. And if you um. don't have neighbors, you don't have running water, and a fire starts you're looking at what could potentially be a total loss. So um, the Hunter family probably cooked in a three-walled lean-to in the backyard. Oh, wow. So, but everything in this kitchen is um, original to the time period. It's not, it wasn't owned by the Hunter family, but it's all from the 18-teens to late 1850s. And the utensils and the fireplace and the pots, iron pots, mm -hmm. cast iron pots are all period correct for this building, this room. Okay. Yes. And um, even an oven, they even have an oven right there. Yes, a bread oven. And the bricks along the bottom of this um, stove there and the wood beam are original to the house. So okay. even though this is a new part of the structure, we did bring in some of those original pieces just to add a little bit more authenticity. Okay. That's really a nifty place. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was nice of the community of Birmingham to actually go do the effort to, to move this and have it here and store it and have guys like you taking us on tours. Is there another room we're gonna look at? Definitely, yeah, we can head into the dining room next. Heck, let's do it. All right, thanks, Caitlin, now we're in the dining room. Yes, 
And it's a, this house is a little bit bigger on the inside than you might expect for a house of the time period and the location. And that's because it was operating like we would think of a bed and breakfast. Okay. So they were having people spending the night in um, the front bedroom. They were selling people food and alcohol. And they might have also had people who were coming to, say, have their wagons fixed and everything come in here. Um, to relax during a that real time community w uh, meeting place for people, strangers and locals. Exactly. In fact, Birmingham's first name was either Hunters or Willets, depending on who whose house or tavern you drank at. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure who had the better liquor of the two, but Willets did have a history of owning a tavern in Detroit, so he might be the better bet there. And maybe we can sample some of that liquor here. Do you still have some of that? <laughs> I'm not sure the city of Birmingham would allow us to put up a still. Uh, okay, all right. I've been I've been pushing, but <laughs> Okay. Now we have a dining room table. Correct, yeah, a dining room table. Um, and there's actually a fun story behind the plates there. Um, so we've gone through a couple different staffing changes at the museum. And of course sometimes you get a little overwhelmed and you might not keep really good records. Um, and so at some point in the past, um, someone took in these lovely plates and didn't write anything down about them. So they're a little bit of a mystery as to who mm. donated them and when, but they're a great piece. And of course, the Hunter family originally, when they first came, probably wouldn't have owned China so fine. Um, but of course, they did become quite wealthy later on through business. So at that point, they could have had very okay. fine china like that. And maybe somebody in our audience, if they can see this china and, and know what, what the pattern is or who might have donated it, please let the museum know. Yeah, I bring that up because, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery here. Of course. <laughs> and we've got a special cabinet right here. Yes, I love this cabinet because even though it is from the 1830s and it is authentic to the time period, it's a fake. Um, so just like today, you can go on Pinterest and find a whole bunch of tutorials for how to make your IKEA particle board furniture look very expensive and look like you spent a lot more than you actually did on it. Same was true in the 1830s. People were trying to keep up with the Kardashians back then too. Um, so what someone did is build this cabinet out of cheaper cuts of wood and then they went back over a period of days, weeks, maybe months, and paint it on this wood grain. So, because then as now, the better, more interesting the wood grain is, the more you're gonna spend on that piece of furniture. So if you wanted to impress people walking into your house and make them think that you had spent more money than you actually did, this was the way to do it. Beautiful cabinet. Now this might hold the china and stuff for the dining room too. Correct, yeah. Um, if you look around, there's no pantry, there's no closets. So really you would have used cupboards and dressers. Yeah, no built-ins. Exactly, yeah. Um, those came quite a bit later. Okay. Is there another thing in this room you want to Definitely. point out to us? Definitely. Um, the sleigh bells over in this case Oh here, yeah. These were actually used by the Hunter family when they moved to the Detroit area in 1819. So they moved here from upstate New York, and they came in the middle of winter, which when I first heard that made absolutely no sense to me. Why would you move somewhere in the middle of winter? But then I actually looked at the map and realized how much water is between upstate New York and Detroit. And in the winter, most of that's gonna be frozen over. So it makes for quite a faster journey sure. than it would have been in the spring or summer or fall and that's why they did it. And in the case as well, we have a traveling knife and fork set from another one of Birmingham's founders, a man named John Hamilton. And he ran a transportation company. Oh. So kind of like today, if you're moving, you know, you can go out and rent a truck and okay. hire some people to help you move. He was the moving service of the day. He'd pick you up in Detroit with his ox cart and if you're going to Pontiac, he'd take you up the Saginaw Trail to Pontiac. If you're stopping at Birmingham, he'd stop here, um, basically wherever you needed to go. Oh, very interesting, mm -hmm. okay. And um, over there as well, we do have our historic microwave oven because the fire in the dining room, you wouldn't have cooked over, but you might have used for warming. Um, so the drawer there would actually help you keep food warm. If you're bringing in food from outside, say in negative 30 degrees, it's gonna cool off a bit. So you'd put it in the drawer there, close the door, build up a nice fire, and it would rewarm your food. Warming you. oven, okay, wow. Exactly. Wow, very, very <laughs> new idea, okay. Thank you, we'll go to the next room now. Wonderful.
Now I want to make sure when you come to visit the Birmingham Museum and you visit the Hunter House, there's a, some interesting history boards here to make sure you see when you're here and Caitlin will tell us about those. Yeah, so it's talking about some of the people who have owned this house in the past. People lived in this house until the city acquired it in 1969. So we've had over 147 years of people calling the Hunter House home. And of course we talked about John West Hunter before. Um, another significant person who has lived here is a man named Henry Randall. And he was actually a veteran of the U.S. Civil War fought in the 24th Michigan Iron Brigade um, oh. at the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh my gosh. And if any Civil War buffs are watching, they know a lot about the Iron Brigade. They know that in the Battle of Gettysburg, they marched in with almost 400 men. And at the end of the day, there was maybe 133 still remaining. Yeah. Henry Randall was one of the lucky ones, but he did lose a finger during the battle. So he convalesced um, in a military hospital for many months, because of course no antibiotics to help with infection and um, all of that um, terrible medical history. Um, but he, in 1890, he fell in love with this home. And the person who owned the home in the grand tradition of Birmingham wanted to tear it down and build something bigger and grander. <laughs> Um, Times don't change. Very, yeah. <laughs> People come into the museum all the time and they complain about this happening now and I kind of have to burst their bubble a little bit and tell them it's been happening since at least 1890 that we have records of. So he actually bought just the house itself and moved it to a plot of land that he owned on what is now Brown Street. Oh, okay. So that was the first time the house was moved. It's been moved twice. Correct. In 1970, it was moved to the location where it is now, next okay. to the Allen House. And we also have a board um, listing every single resident who has lived in this house. Now, in the 20s, and for a couple decades on either side of that, it was a rental property, which is probably another reason why the house was saved. Um, you're not going to tear down your rental property to build something big and grand to keep up with the Joneses. Um, if it's small and it's functional, it works for that purpose. Sure. All right, so make sure when you come here that you come to this room and read these plaques. They're very interesting history of the original owners. Now we're in another very important room in the Hunter House. Yes, this is the master bedroom of the house. So this would have been where John Hunter and his wife and possibly a couple of their kids would have slept. Of course, kids often didn't have their own bedroom back then. Um, they were packed in as tight as they needed to be. And since this house only had two bedrooms, several of the kids might have been bunking with their parents here. And one of the great things about this room is I get to talk about the origin of the phrase sleep tight. We say this a lot to people. Uh, we might not realize yep. what this comes from. And it comes from the manner of bed construction that they used. So instead of a um, system of slats or a box spring like we have underneath our modern day mattresses, they built a lattice work of ropes. It's a rope bed. Yeah, and these ropes would get loose oh. through use. So every couple of days, you would have had to tighten up these ropes. Otherwise, you would have gotten in the bed sunk to the floor and not been able to get back out. So even going to bed back then was a little bit of a chore. And of course, you're in the middle of the wilderness. Um, you might not want to go out to the outhouse at night, especially if it was very, very cold. So a chamber pot like this was an absolutely essential piece of any bedroom. Um, and of course, every morning that had to be emptied. And I always tell the kids that come through on tours, it was probably emptied by the kid who had misbehaved the most the day before. So <laughs> you had an added incentive to obeying your parents back then. <laughs> of course, yeah. And on the wall here, we have a sampler. And this is really representative of what um, young girls would have done at the time. So this was done by an eight-year-old girl named Sarah Warren in 1838. And when a young man came over who was wishing to get you be know you better in a romantic way, instead of your parents busting out embarrassing baby photos of you, <laughs> they would be bringing out the sampler to show how accomplished of a young woman that you were. Not only did you have the skills to sew clothing for your family and keep them warm, you also had very fine embroidery skills which could bring in extra money should your family ever need it. And wow. 
And of course, your 1822 shower right here as well. Um, most people, if they did bathe, might have bathed once a week at that time. Um, so in the mornings, you would wash your face and maybe your armpits just to keep you smelling a little bit better than the livestock that you had out in the backyard. So the idea is here that pitcher is filled with water mm -hmm. and you take the, lift the pitcher up, pour it in the bowl, that becomes the basin, and you use that to wash and so on. Okay. Correct, yeah, kind of uh, like a sink without running water. Excellent. That's well, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And oh. another thing that your parents might bring out when a young man comes to court you, because of course 1822 in Birmingham, there's nowhere to go on a date would be a courting candle like we have over on the dresser there, the one with the coils around it. Of course, candles would have been very easy to make. You can make them out of beeswax. You could also make them out of animal fat. Uh, it would make your house smell like the world's sketchiest Arby's, but you know, <laughs> everyone was kind of smelly back then anyway, so you might not have noticed too much. Um, but the coils there, the story goes, um, some of those had a bell on them, Others were just coils. But your parents would bring that out and they'd say, okay, you have until the third coil or until the candle burns out. Timing and, device. Yeah, and then he has to leave. So if you had a bell on it, you know, it would go around the coils as the candle melted and it would ding at the end. Um, so we have a lot of reports of young couples, if they really liked each other, they'd be trying to make that candle burn slower. Of course, if you didn't like the guy who came over and your mom's like, oh, just give him a chance, he's great, you might be trying to make that sucker burn a little bit quicker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is an interesting room and thanks for the information on this. Now we're gonna go to? We're gonna go to the parlor next. Oh, great, let's go to the parlor. Now Caitlin's gonna take us through the parlor. Yes, so this is the parlor or the living room of the house where you might have come after a hard day of working outside in the foundry or in the garden, hewing trees, doing what needed to be done. Now, one of the most important things about this room is we did cut out a piece of the wall when we moved it here just to show everyone That's how it. the house was made. It's a manner of construction that's very unusual in Michigan and the Midwest, but you see a lot of in New England, particularly in Connecticut, where John West Hunter's father was from. And we know his father helped build this house. Okay. So it's called vertical plank construction. And what it is, is it's a timber frame first, and then you'll put um, planks of wood about two inches thick, and you'll nail those on either side of that construction and then cover it with a plaster made with horse hair. So the walls in actuality are about yay thick, which is fantastic if you're dealing with hurricane force winds several times a year. Doesn't do much to keep out the extreme cold of the Midwest. And that okay. goes to show why that manor construction was abandoned fairly shortly in this area because it was a lot of work for not a huge payoff. And a lot of the lumber and timber in this house probably came in this vicinity. Correct, yes. And when we moved the house here, we did raise the ceilings a little bit to expose these fantastic wood beams. Um, and you can tell these are hand hewn because yes. they are quite straight, um, but they're not perfectly straight like you might buy at a lumber yard or Home, Home Depot. And the head of the nails are very interesting too, because of course round headed nails only come in once we started mass manufacturing nails. At this time period, a lot of people were still making their own nails for their own house by hand. So you might have square headed nails, yes, you might yeah. just have oblong headed nails, um, whatever you could get. Got it, all right. And then is, is this a significant uh, po uh, portrait here? Actually, this is another mystery here at the museum. Um, so okay. what we know about this painting was it was bought at auction by a group um, called the Questers, who supplied a lot of, of the furniture that we have in this house. And it was bought in Grand Rapids, and we don't have any other information about her. Um, what her name might have been, where she came from. So we do know she was probably very wealthy, um, just based on the size of the portrait and the details in the portrait. So she has a lot of lace work. She has a lot of very fine jewelry. Um, but we have her up here in the hopes that A, I mean, it's a beautiful portrait, and B, we hope that maybe at some point someone will come in and say, you know, I have some old family photos and that looks like my great, 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 great aunt Mildred. And, you know, maybe we can put a name 
with the face. Well, it fits, it fits the style and it fits the room very well. Definitely. And um, the other portrait that we have in this room, the big one there, uh, that is Dr. Ebenezer Raynal. He was the first doctor in Birmingham, and both his son and his grandson followed in his footsteps. And he was also uh, a member of Michigan's first constitutional convention. And the story goes that at that convention, he got so ill that his fellow congressmen thought he was going to die. So they packed him up in a wagon, sent him home, fully expecting he would die on the trail on the way home. Um, he got better and outlived everyone else who had been there that day. So, oh very stubborn. It's a lucky house. Yes, very stubborn lucky man. Lucky doctor. <laughs> All right, well, this is a great, great uh, parlor room, nice fireplace, nice mm -hmm. furniture. And we're going to go to the next room. The children's room or the front bedroom that John West Hunter would have rented out to travelers along the trail. Oh, let's take a look. All right. Right, there's a lot to know in the children's bedroom, and there's a very um, interesting piece of furniture here. Right, Caitlin? There is, yes. So we have this front bedroom set up like the children's room, but of course this was the front bedroom that John West Hunter would have rented out to travelers visiting along the trail. So kind of like when Grandma comes to visit for Christmas, um, you're sent packing either up to the attic, you might be bunking with your parents, um, just to clear out the room and make it a room for someone else. So we have obviously a bed, a crib, the potty chair, which is, I mean, just potty integral chair. to this Wait room. A uh, potty chairs have not changed in their basic construction for the last couple centuries. You know, parents might like that. If you ever potty trained a kid, you've had a piece of furniture like that in your home before. Um, another yes. interesting tidbit about this room is Henry Randall, the man we talked about earlier, the Civil War veteran. Uh, when he came back from battle, he still had a lot of shrapnel in his body, and that made it very painful for him. And he spent his last few years convalescing in this room. And in fact, we have some great stories of children who grew up in Birmingham around that time period. Um, and they talk about how Henry Randall was always leaning out the window trying to pass money to them so that they could go to the corner store and buy him pipe tobacco because he loved smoking in bed. Now, Mrs. Randall did not like him smoking in bed because he had set fire to the room a couple times. So when the kids were coming back, it was always kind of a big game to them to try to avoid Mrs. Randall, who was out front patrolling, trying to stop Henry from smoking in bed. And another big piece um, of this room, I love this p portrait of Don and Vern Fouracre. Um, in fact, Don here was actually one of the many children who have been born in this house throughout its history. They lived here in the late 19-teens, early 1920s, but they were almost never born at all. Both of their parents were from England. Um, so in late 1910, Albert proposed to Alice, his beloved. And then Albert came over to the US to try to find work. Um, there wasn't too much going for him back in England. So he wanted to come over here, get a good job, make some money to be able to provide for a family. And then send for his beloved. Right, and a little while later, they were planning originally to be separated for several more years. But in late 1911, Albert writes to Alice and he tells her about how much he misses her. And he knows their plan was in the, for another couple of years, but he's like, please come. You know, I found a great job with the Detroit United Railway line. I found this fantastic place we can live. You know, please come, we'll get married, we can start our family. And he tells her to take a ship from the White Star Line because he had a really good experience sailing with them. Because of course, 1911, the only way to cross the Atlantic was by ship. So Alice goes out, and according to the family story, she buys a ticket for the very first White Star Line ship sailing that spring, and that's the Titanic. And she was able to afford a second class ticket. She worked for a very wealthy family as a seamstress, so she was able to afford that second class ticket. And um, a couple weeks before the ship was due to set sail, representatives of the White Star Line came to her and asked to sell the ticket back. Um, they had oversold the first class cabins and apparently they didn't have room for the um, baggage or domestic pa staff of those first class passengers. And they wanted to put them in the second class cabins. So Alice very luckily sells back her ticket um, and I hope I'm not going to ruin a fantastic 90s movie for everyone when I say that the Titanic does sink 
Um, Leonardo DiCaprio does die. It's very sad. Um, but Alice wasn't aboard that ship. Um, and she had scrapbooks full of clippings about this huge disaster because, of course, she was a second-class passenger or was going to be. And she could um, have been on it. Yeah, second-class passengers fared slightly better than third-class, but, of course, there was still a huge loss of life. So it was probably very likely had she been on the ship, she would have not made it. Um, and, of course, today I would have been like, you know, Albert, it's been real, but I'm going to stay in England or at least wait until iceberg season's over. Um, Alice was made of much sterner stuff than I am because she went out and bought a ticket on the very next sh ship that she could. She had to wait a week. Um, the White Star Line had bought up a lot of coal to make sure that there was no competition for the Titanic on her maiden voyage. Um, so she boarded the Lusitania a week later and a week after she arrived in New York, she and Albert were wed. They moved to Birmingham and several um, of their kids grew up here, attended Baldwin High School, which was right across the street. And uh, yeah, had a very happy life. And we didn't know this story about her because apparently she did not um, talk about it very much until her grandchildren actually uncovered this story after she had passed and communicated it to us. A wonderful story. Well, I want to thank Caitlin and the Birmingham Museum for allowing us to take this tour of the Hunter House. And I wanted to ask Caitlin, there's much more here at the Birmingham Museum complex to see. What other things can we come here and bring the family to wander through this, this really, uh, we're really lucky to have this. What, what else can we see here? Yeah, so there is another historic building on site, the Allen House. And right now we are just in the process of putting up our brand new exhibit, Birmingham Before and After. Okay. So if you remember things like the Jacobson store in Birmingham, um, Peabody's Market and Restaurants. That's right. Um, grew up reading the Birmingham Eccentric. You're going to love this new exhibit. Uh, we also have the Hill School Bell from the first, first through twelfth grade school built in Birmingham in 1869. Um, and if you ask nicely, I'll show you how to ring it. <laughs> well, Caitlin said if I ask nicely, which I did, I get to ring this bell. Here we go. Wow. That's loud. And we are open Tuesday through Saturday, 1 to 4 p.m. And admission is $7 for adults, $5 for students and seniors, and children under five and members of the museum are free. Good to know. We're really happy uh, that the, the collectors could come here today and see the, the show in the complex. And uh, if you have any questions or you have a collection you want to talk about, love to have you on the show. So. Please contact me, Kent Lund, at bctvthecollectors at gmail.com. Thanks.